We want to welcome you to the uh, 11.30 Wednesday lunch and Bible study from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. We're uh, currently in a series called The Foundation Doctrines of the Holy Spirit taught by Jesus in John 13 through 17 in what we call the Last Supper period. That's the advent of the Holy Spirit into the world it sets up the new covenant period, and it sets up the church age. New covenant church age. That's really important. And so there's a lot of confusion. People just really don't separate these two ideas, and they don't pay enough attention to how Jesus was teaching. Uh, and so what he was teaching, and I, I'll give you an example of it. Our, our text today is John 16, 7, and 8. I want to read that, and then we're, we're going to do a study from it. He says to his disciples, but I tell you the truth. Remember, when you say that, sometimes it's verily, verily I say to you, or when he says, I tell you the truth, is something very important doctrinally that they should really get. We would want to highlight that. We'll see it back again in an important way in our life. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Now, go away means he's going to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world, be buried and raised from the dead on the third day, spend 40 days of post-resurrection appearances, and then go away. I mean, he's going to go away two times. He's going to go away on death. He goes to Sheol, and then he comes back, and he spends 40 days, and then he goes away. Be seated at the right hand of God the Father, and you will not see him again until the second coming. It is to your advantage, it is to our advantage that Jesus Christ goes away. And then he says, watch these two things. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, shall not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. Verse 8. And when he comes... See, when he comes is a very important phrase. We'll talk about it today. But that's a timeline from the Last Supper to his going away. And his going away is a timeline connection to the Holy Spirit's advent into the world that establishes the new covenant and the church age. And when he comes, he will convict the world Concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. This is, that we have studied this. The convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit is one of the seven foundation doctrines. I'm spending time on this idea of I've got to go away. Jesus says, I've got to leave, and the Holy Spirit's going to come in my place. He's called the helper, and he's going to establish the new covenant, and a dispensation under it called the church age. Really important. And all of that is going to be based on him leaving. He's going to die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead third day. We call that the gospel. If you believe it, you get saved. If you don't believe it, you're not saved. It's not about going to church. You, get, you do that when you get saved, and, and it's important. It's very important. It's one of the great important uh, places in your community is where the the assembly, uh, the, the gathering of the body of Christ into an assembly where the word is taught and God is praised and songs are sung and yada, yada. So he says, look, I've got to go away. It's by, by death on the cross, burial, goes to Sheol for three days, comes back out of the grave, 40 days of post-resurrection uh, post appearances, where he teaches on the subject again, then he's going to leave by ascension, and he's going to be in session at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. When After 10 days of that session, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that today. Jesus calls that Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. And it's different. That is different than the Holy Spirit. Once he gets here, he will baptize. But... It's getting him here so that he can do that. 
So we're going to study that today. People make, uh, they don't pay attention, and, and they, they miss some really important aspects of this idea. So let's, let's stop and have prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in the church age is personal sin. Personal sin. Could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, overt sins. To get out of carnality and back to the spirituality of the indwelling Holy Spirit who enters your life at the point of salvation and can never leave it, John 14, 16, and 17, then you have to understand that when you confess your sins, it takes you out of carnality and puts you back into spirituality. That's the principle of sanctification. In other words, confession of sin puts you back at the cross. 1 John 1, 9. Here's what it says. If, I, if, if we confess our sins, talking to believers, personal sin, whatever it might be, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. That word cleansing goes back to verse 7. It is the work of Christ on the cross for the believer. When a believer is carnal, he, he has been walking in the flesh. He's been walking by sight. He's carnal. He's not spiritual. He's a believer, but he's a carnal believer. What does he do to become a spiritual believer again? How does he get connected back up with the Holy Spirit who's still there in his life? How, how does he do that? He confesses his sin. He names his sin. He mentions it to God. He, he confesses it to God, to the Lord, who, who has paid the, pri, pri, the, the penalty, and that's been taken away brought us into sonship, the, the penalty of Adam's sin, and brought us into, into uh, sonship with God Almighty, which is forever. You're all, once you're born again, you're always born into the family of God. You're always in the family of God. Even when you're away from God, Luke 15, the prodigal son, you're still a member of the family. When he returned as a prodigal son, he was a son. Well, let's take a moment, let's get that done, and let's get into the morning study entitled, Christ Baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for all of your love, mercy, and grace extended to us through the work of Christ on the cross. And then as a believer, we are ministered through the Holy Spirit. We're ministered through the Word of God under the principle of walking by faith. I pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would once again teach and recall. I pray he would guide us into all truth, disclose all truth to us, not only the things that are present, but the things that are to come. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, here we are today. We're going to look at this. Today, I'm going to talk about Christ, Christ baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Next week, I'm going to close this series out by teaching you about the Holy Spirit baptizing. The Holy Spirit baptizing. Jesus baptizes, the Holy Spirit baptizes. Jesus has to baptize with the Holy Spirit before the Holy Spirit can baptize as part of his ministry in in. Uh, Time, church age. So point number one, I've got four ideas I want to share with you about Christ baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Jesus introduced this doctrine to his disciples during the Last Supper with a special phrase that's recorded in uh, John 16 in the passage I read. It is a little phrase in verse 8. And when he comes, I've got to go away, and he's coming. I'm leaving, he's coming. I'm leaving, he's coming. I'm leaving, he's coming. That's the idea. And he does it with the, with the phrase, and he, when he comes. And then he talks about what he'll do. When he comes. When he comes, that he will convict. When he comes. When he comes, but I've got to go away first. Say, I've got to go away. It, this is mentioned in verse 8. It's also mentioned in verse 17.
Uh, he talks about it a little while, and a little while I will be with you, then a little while I won't. Uh, that's the idea within that structure. Um, when, when, pay attention to the idea of when, when. In, um, in verse 13 of uh, John 16, in verse 13, he says, and when he, the spirit of truth, comes, and he talks about another idea. He will guide you and disclose to you. There's two different ministries. I, I've, I've, we've already taught, and you've studied it. If you've been with me, if not, you know, go to our website and pick them up. So this special phrase, when the helper comes, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, it talks about he will have a ministry. Jesus will be in heaven, and the Holy Spirit will be on earth executing the plan of God. Jesus will set, be sitting on the throne, and he will be the head of the organization. And he will be running it. But the Holy Spirit will be the operational person. The wind phrase, the wind phrase that I just mentioned, was used by Jesus to put a timeline from him to his leaving to the coming of the Holy Spirit, which is Christ baptizing with the Spirit. Jesus taught that the advent of the Holy Spirit was connected with his ascension and session at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. I laid this out more clearly on your paper. That is John 16, 7 and 8. When he says, I tell you the truth, I've got to go away. And it's just something. Jesus says, I've got to go away and the Holy Spirit's got to come. I've got to go away and he's got to come. All right, and, and when he comes, it'll be his ministry time. In John 14, 16, Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Now, that word another, Jesus is leaving. That word another is alas. That means another of the same kind or a member of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Son is going to leave the earth by ascension and into session. And 10 days into session, after 10 days, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit when he comes. And that when he comes experience is called Christ baptizing with the Holy Spirit. So it's important you understand that. John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. In John 14, 26, Jesus said, whom the Father will send in my name. The, whom the Father will send. Talking about the, the helper, the Holy Spirit. Whom the Father will send in my name. John 15, 26. The Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father. Sunday, I taught on the Abrahamic covenant in a series called Justification by Faith out of Romans 4 and 5. And I taught, I taught in that lesson the importance of listening when God or Jesus says, I will. When God says, I will, or Jesus says, I will. I used an example for you at John 6, 40, where the I will, the first I will is God speaking it, and the second I will is Jesus speaking it. Well worth your read. Because what you get is you get to see when God says, I will something to your life, I will it to you. It's because you're an heir because you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've been adopted into the family of God, Romans 8, 14 through 17. You, you've been adopted into the family of God, and you are an heir in Christ. You have an inheritance by grace. All of this is by grace, not by works. You don't get it by works. You don't keep it by works. It's a gift. And you pay attention to what God has willed to you as an heir what he has willed to you. This shows you what, how God has obligated himself to you. 
That's why on your part, when you look at that will, you understand that God has obligated himself to do that for you. That's unconditional love. That's grace operating to my life. It's not dependent on me. What is dependent on me is to me to, to believe that and to act according to my faith. I walk by faith, not by sight. You see, that's kind of important here because in John 14, 26, whom the Father will send, in other words, God says, I will send, and then in 15, 26 of John, I will send. You see, the important part of when God gives his will to you, he obligates himself, he wills it and obligates himself on your part You've got, to, you've got to believe that will of God, and you've got to operate from God's will, not my own. Even Jesus had to do that in Matthew 26, going to the cross. Here is Acts 1, 5. He tells his disciples, but before he ascends, he says, but wait for what the Father has promised, which he said, you heard from me not many days from now. Wait for what the Father has promised not many days from now. In fact, when he leaves by ascension in, in Acts 1.11, caught up into the heavens, it will be 10 days exactly to Pentecost. We know that because of the four holidays of the crucifixion that's connected. Passover, unleavened bread, that's an eight-day festival. Once unleavened bread starts on the 15th of Nisan, the first Saturday, weekly Saturday, the very next day after the weekly Sabbath in the week of unleavened bread is first fruits. That's Sunday in our calendar or the first day of the week is a, is a festival. It's first fruits. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23 talk about Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. He was raised on that time. And when you count from first fruits festival, 50 days is Pentecost, which was the feast of weeks, seven weeks. The next day is Pentecost, 50th Pentecost means 50th. In his post-resurrection appearances, he spent 40 days after his resurrection, he spent 40 days in post-resurrection appearances. He goes back and sits at the right hand of God the Father, and he sends back the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, Acts 2. got to read Acts 1, people. You got to eat. You got to read. You got to study a little bit. In Luke 24, on your paper, if you, if you don't have your, let's pause. If you didn't pull down the notes, that you're supposed to have a Bible, a pencil, and a piece of paper, and your, you know, your Bible, and just Bible study. Write down Luke 24. 45 through 49, listen to verse 49. Now he's talking to the two disciples after his resurrection, during a post-resurrection appearance, during those 40 days, he's meeting with two disciples that are kind of confused of what's, what's happened over this Passover season. And he says, and behold, I am sending forth, this is 
at the close of his time with these disciples. He says, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. You know what that is? That's Jesus at Pentecost. That's Jesus baptizing his followers. And he's talking to two of them right there on the road to Damascus. He's talking to two of them. To Damascus. He's talking to two of them. And he says to them, I'm sending forth the promise of my father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from the high. They're going to have to stay to Pentecost. He says, I'd encourage you to stay. Isn't that interesting? Now, you have to study a little bit to get this and thing. Say, so, well, I've never heard anything like that. <laughs> I'm just telling you simple Bible stuff. I, I, this is not complicated. Oh, oh. Just read the last chapter of, of, of Luke 24 and the first chapter of Acts. That's all I've talked about. Point number two. Now, I want you to pay attention. As, an, as a national prophet to Israel, John the Baptist prophesied that when Christ came into the world, he would inaugurate, at some point, he would inaugurate the advent or the coming of the Holy Spirit. Write this down. Matthew 3, 11 and 12. Mark 1, 7 and 8. Luke 3, 16 and 18. John 1, 25 through 35. See, John really covered this. He covered John's ministry to identify the Messiah and how it was done and how it's connected to Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Oh, you got to read all this stuff. I mean... I just give it to you. I can't possibly look, read every one of these, all these things. I just read. Here's Matthew. Here's Matthew 3.11. As for me, John the Baptist speaking, I baptize you with water for repentance. In other words, to, to understand you've got to change your mind about the source of your salvation. It's not the law. It's Jesus Christ and grace. It's not Moses and the law. It's Christ and grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself as a gift. So he uses the word repentance, metanoia. They've got to have a change of, 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 of mind. As for me, John the Baptist, I baptize you with water for repentance. Because, so his whole purpose of ministry was to uh, do water baptism until he baptized, because he didn't know, until he baptized a male Israelite. And when he did, the Holy Spirit would come upon him. John said he, he recognized it, and he identified, knew that coming like a dove and lighting upon him. He knew, and a voice out of heaven, he knew that way that that person, that male Israelite, was the Messiah, the Christ. In that John passage, he, he says to the, his disciples, stop following me and start following him, for he is the Lamb of God that's come to save the world from their sin. John 1, 29. Well, here we are. I'm in Matthew 3, 11. John is teaching. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not worthy to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And he explains fire in verse 12, which is the second coming of Christ. He, John says he's coming and Jesus Christ is coming. 
And at some point, he is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Matthew. Now, John's going to tell you the same thing in John 1, in verse 33, 34. He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, God told John. This is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself, says John, have seen and testify that this one, pointing to Jesus Christ, is the Son of God. And he points to his disciples, follow him, he's your Messiah. And many of John's disciples did, not all, but many did. That was the group that Jesus started with. When you read John, the fourth chapter in verses 1 and 2, you will discover that during the ministry life of Jesus Christ, all the way to his ascension and session, all the way through his ascension, Jesus Christ never baptized anybody, not in water nor in spirit. John 4, 1 and 2. Here's what verse 2 says. Although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, that was water. Remember, Jesus taught that he must go from the earth before the Holy Spirit could come, before he could baptize with the Holy Spirit, he had to leave the earth in order to baptize with the Holy Spirit, which was the coming of the Holy Spirit's ministry into the world. The third member of the Godhead's great ministry is under the New Covenant and the Church Age. Boy, it would, if you could understand this and wrap your brain around this and study the stuff we give you, the material we give you, and study it under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, it would so enlighten your life. Jesus said, I must go, I must leave before he can come. That exercise is going to be Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit from heaven. The Holy Spirit baptizes on earth. This is the only time Jesus is going to baptize. He baptizes from heaven by sending the Holy Spirit. And once the Holy Spirit comes, he takes up the work. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk about it next week. You need to get this stuff clear in your brain. Point number three. During the post-resurrection appearances, that 40-day period from his resurrection to his ascension, during the post-resurrection appearances, Jesus taught again on his baptizing with the Holy Spirit with the phrase, not many days from now. I just talked about that. Not many days would actually be, once he, goes, once he leaves the earth, will be 10 days. 10 days to Pentecost. And isn't it interesting? We don't, even think, we don't even think about this stuff. We should, but we don't. Eh, that's all right, because guys like me think about it. When you go to Acts, the second chapter, when you go to Acts, the second chapter, everybody knows that what we're talking about in Acts 2, having read Acts 1, ha having read Acts 1, and now we're in Acts 2. Look at verse 1. I just want to show you something. Listen, what we call Pentecost today in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost had come, 
it wasn't called Pentecost. On that day in Acts 2, in the Jewish nation, it was not called Pentecost. It was called the Feast of Weeks or Harvest. We go to Leviticus 23, and you can read about the whole festival. It's listed there in the, amidst the, the, the national festivals of Messianic history, Shadow Christology. Isn't it interesting that Luke, who writes the book of Acts, which is volume two, Luke, Luke volume one, Acts volume two, this is in 61 AD. This, this festival, this thing is called Pentecost. It was never called Pentecost except in the church. It was called the Feast of Weeks. It was about the 70, it was about the 70, it's the seven weeks, the 50th day. Seven weeks and the 50th day. It was shadow Christology of Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Seated in heaven, he did that. It was his first declaration uh, of authority according to the promise of the Father. But by by from 30 A.D. to 61 A.D., this, this doctrine, this, the Feast of Weeks is now called Pentecost, and Pentecost is a, is a whole system of a doctrinal thinking. It's a term for a whole doctrine under the new covenant of the church age. And a Bible wonderful. See, I, 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 I'm a pastor who teaches isagogical, exegetical, and categorical. I just did that by explaining Pentecost to you. What a wonderful idea. I mean, we call Pentecost, we know when we do the church, anybody with half a wit of history in their heart knows when we talk about Pentecost, we're talking about Acts 2. It changed this whole, it changed the whole dynamics under the new covenant. This, this doctrine, it's, it's all been changed. It, it's been under fulfillment. I mean, it was shadow Christology, uh, Hebrews 10.1, it was shadow Christology until this great act when Christ baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now that act of Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit taking up the ministry of baptizing people, believers, this is the doctrine called Pentecost. So all of them call it that. They talk about Pentecost. Until, until you get deep into the book of Acts, you have to pay attention because they're still celebrating the Jews are still celebrating the feast, uh, the, these festivals. They still go in, uh, to Pentecost as, as Jewish people in synagogues and temple and doing it. And, but the believer understands how it was fulfilled. The unbeliever doesn't. <laughs> but Book of Acts knows it. So sometimes when you read the Book of Acts, it may be on the day of Pentecost. And they're referring to the, the Jewish festival. But you see, under that, see, the, the, the term Pentecost has been forever doctrinally changed because of the new covenant and the church age teaching. I just think that's interesting. I just think that's interesting. Now, here's what you missed in Acts 2.1. The word when. Watch this. And when the day of Pentecost had come. 
You wait in Jerusalem for the wait, wait for the promise of the Father. Yeah, that's what he told them. That's what he told all of his disciples. Well, that day's come. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered in one place. Now, where are they? See, people, people, listen, you can't come up with your own idea about who they are. There are people in, in chapter 1. And who are these people? Well, here they are. They're in verse 15. Here's verse 15. At that time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 people who were there together and said, <laughs> that's 120, 120 believers of followers of Christ who have gathered to wait for the promise of the Father not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for it, for Christ will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It will be the coming of the Holy Spirit and his great ministry. So when we get to Acts 2, and we're in verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost had come, they, they were all gathered together. Who are these people? This is the 120. Now, there are a lot of people gathered at Pentecost, the festival, that were Jews. Maybe some were believers. Maybe some weren't. But when Pentecost, when Peter gets through preaching at Pentecost, the whole, and Jesus baptizes the 120, the 120 began to have such great ministry, it converted missionaries in 15 different nations that were in attendance who went home missionaries for Christ. Boy, you should read Acts 1 and 2 to see what happened at Pentecost when Jesus baptized 120 and the Holy Spirit began to work in miraculous and powerful ways in the life of these people. And who were these 120? Primarily Galileans. They were accused because they could speak such fluent languages of all these different people that were in attendance who heard the gospel preached in their own language. Peter is preaching, and the Holy Spirit is the interpreter. Allah, he's, he's preaching it, and the people are speaking in tongues, quote, languages. They're interpreting it. Listen, they're interpreting it to these other people who are getting saved and being baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And it says, and they were being added daily to the body of Christ. W who was the original body? That 120. That turned into 3,000, that turned into 5,000, that turned into you and I. Oh, it does well to read it all. It does well to read them all. Gathering them together. Acts 1, 4, and 5, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me, John baptizes with water, but you, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. John 7, 38 and 39, Jesus tried to prep them early in his ministry about his baptism. He said, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being, that would be John 14, 16, and 17. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will take residence inside. Will flow from his innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, 
whom those who believed in him were to receive. When are they going to get it? Pentecost. And from Pentecost, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. He's got to die on a cross. He's got to be buried, raised from the dead, 40 days of post-resurrection appearances, the ascension, and then the session where he's seated at the right hand of God the Father with all authority in heaven. Was one of the first things he does? Boom, Pentecost. As Peter stood up in the midst of their brethren, preached in the Galilean, preached this marvelous message. Tongues broke out. Interpreters and tongues broke out. Tongues broke out. People heard the gospel preached in their own dialect. And people were, people were saved that day like you can't believe. The ascension of Jesus Christ. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into the heavens. Here's his session. Acts 2.33. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received, and having received the Father's promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth both, he has poured for, forth Christ, which is Christ baptizing with the Holy Spirit. This which you both see in here. That's at Pentecost. Therefore, I've just captured point four for you. Ten days after Jesus was seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to baptize believers at Pentecost, the 120. Then the Holy Spirit began to bring conversion. It's still doing it today. Acts 1.8, Jesus said, you will receive power. You can see it at Pentecost. You will, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both. Isn't that interesting? Now, when you count it, see both. Both. Are you and your wife both coming? Well, when you read that, you don't see that. Listen to this. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. How do you get both? Well, what, 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 what do you mean both? Does that not bother you when you read that? Does that not go like, whoa, wait a minute. Both? Both? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and uttermost parts of the earth? Both? No, it's a way to tell you that there's two sections. Both in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Did you get that? Listen, you will start learning to read the Bible and listen to the Holy Spirit if you will, if you will let him teach you and recall. If you, if you will let him guide you and will let him disclose these things to you, like John 14, 15, 16 says, I've done an in-depth study with you on the seven foundation doctrines that are important to the church under the new covenant. And listen, when, 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 listen, you've got spiritual eyes to see this. You, 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 
You've got to read and, and ask the Holy Spirit, what, what is this? What, what are we talking about here? And he's going to show it to you. My job is to point these things out to you as a teacher. I can't begin to tell you, I only have an hour with you, and my hour's up. You need to go to, listen, you can, you, you, look, look, you can't get this in this one lesson. You've got to hear this several times. You've got to, you, listen, you go to our website, doctrinalstudies.com. You pull this down. It'll be, it'll be up on our website in a day or two with all the notes. And you need to study the whole series as, as a unit. You need to study the Bible with your sins confessed and looking for God to teach you his will. Teach me your will, Father. To show me what you have obligated yourself to me about so that I can understand how, how important it is to my life to surrender my will to that will because that will is so good for me. I did. It's been good for me. Every day. I fell in love with Jesus Christ. And the next thing, I fell in love with his word. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't read enough in the Bible about the person that saved me from hell. Saved me from myself a self-destructive life. For me to study the Bible is just like gold. It's just to discover the will of God, to discover these things in the Bible, to be able to understand them and try to make sense out of it. And how does it work in my life? Well, I tell you, it's all about the Holy Spirit's ministry in your life. I can tell you that. And the word of God. The two great walks in your life. You walk by means of the Holy, indwelling Holy Spirit, not by flesh. You don't walk by your sin nature. You walk by faith in the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. You walk by that faith, not by sight. Sunday, we'll be back here on Sunday, 9.30. Go to our website. There's more food there. Listen, there should be no hungry Christians who ever tap into us. There's more information on that website. You couldn't live five lives and get it all. We've been cranking this stuff out for 47 years here. And John Dyer has taken it upon himself to record just about every bit of it. And uh, you ought to pay attention to my current studies because I'm growing. I never see the same study. I mean, the, the foundational structure of it is always the same, but I'm always learning new things. God is showing me because of my growth. He's showing me more things and, and more things to talk about about certain things. It's been a pleasure to be with you today, and I want you to know that. I take none of this for granted. I take it for grace. And I'm, I'm just thrilled to death to be able to stand here and teach a little bit each week with you. Well, let's close on a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for these who have come our way by the Internet, who the Holy Spirit has directed them at some point in their spiritual growth to tap into us. If they're within 40-mile radius of this church, they ought to be coming. We're open on Sundays at 9.30 because of the COVID restrictions. Just bring a mask. We've got you distance enough. God is still in control. He's still in control. 
We thank you, Father, for these that have, that have sat with us today. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to their life as he's promised. And they would fall in love with the word of God as we have in Jesus' name. Amen.